You hear that? Do you hear that cactus run? Ableist! You f***ing ableist eco-fascist! You know, sometimes the Tourette's just comes out. I thought that bird was saying something. You hear him up there? The, the cactus wrens are cute. I thought he was saying something else. Then, you know, I just start channeling Tourette's from other places. Anyway, welcome to another episode of Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't. I'm in a place that's near and dear to my heart. Down here in Baja, California. Right where the California Floristic Province, the chaparral, that maritime chaparral, starts to turn into desert, as you can probably tell from the uh, abundance of uh, agaves and Stenocereus gomosus, the galloping cactus, uh, that's growing right there. And also got some nice choyas. Look at massive Dudleya pulverolenta. Blue bush right there is all in Celia ferrarosa. I think there's a ambrosia in there as well. But anyway, we're going to go check out see some of the stuff that's going on here. A lot of nice stuff going on, like this... Uh, Agave shawii subspecies gold maniana, all right, which is an ecotype of agave shawii. Agave shawii is actually native to San Diego County as well. It goes all the way up there. Uh, this is a more desert adapted subspecies that gets a little bit more robust. Look at that massive inflorescence, about a thousand flowers on there, if not more. Ones at the bottom are already done. The ones up top have not opened yet. And the ones three quarters of the way up are still going off. You got Pachycereus pringlei in the background. You got Fulcuria columnaris, the bujum tree, and Fulcuria splendens, its relative, the ocotillo, growing together, occupying different niches. You can see the ocotillo can take a little bit more on drier conditions. Anyway, let's get up there and go see what's going on. You can see the rock. It's just a conglomeration of all these alluvial deposits sourced from various mountains further up the arroyo. All right, because we got a bunch of different kinds of parent material here that have all been tumbled and rounded over however many thousands of years as they slowly make their way down by flash fl flood after flash flood by flash flood after flash flood down into the arroyo and then all gets cemented together uh, with this uh, with the sand in between. They come apart. They come out pretty easy, but you can see they're all rounded. So it's a nice conglomerate. But then up there... That's where we've got the real magic. We've got those Cretaceous sediments, as you can see up there. A bunch of magnetite, you can see that. All this black sand. Same stuff you see on the beach up uh, by the Bay Area. That beast of a goddamn agave. Look at that, those fucking huge inflorescences. Oh, you got a Hummer up there. You got some, uh, I saw some bees. Probably bats are hitting it at night, surely, too. You can see it's mostly done. So it's just like a more inland and hot adapted uh, subspecies of uh, agave shawii, which again, you get on coastal San Diego County. Used to be a lot more up in San Diego County, but most of the habitat's been turned into uh, strip malls and housing tracks. You got a nice lupin with that white banner petal and a purple keel. You got a little bit of hairs on that stem too. Growing as an annual here in the wash, those notorious palmate leaves, got a red margin on them as well. Tons of lupin diversity. I still can't get over it. Beautiful agave. You can see we'd, uh, we'd be about, I don't know, 15 feet underwater during uh, some of the flash floods, the record flash floods that have occurred here. Kind of wild. You can see all the brush piled up right there. Louie's just having, she's having a nice time. You know, those cactus wrens just been up there that whole time just talking mad amounts of shit, you know, and, and they think that we don't, we don't hear it. Look at that Steno series, Gomosis. Alamosensis is a nice one from mainland Mexico. But meanwhile, Gomosis is what uh, we get down here in Baja. And you get them, you start getting them just north of Ensenada when you're coming in on that, that highway. You'll see them on the cliffs up there just looking like octopi or some sort of squid with its head stuck in the ground, all the tentacles sticking out. It's nice when you see a giant Dudley at the base of them. Anyway, over here where Alan's standing, we're going to look at a plant. That uh, this is actually my first time seeing it, and I was I was sitting there looking at it. You can see the river or this arroyo, the intermittent uh, flash floods you get have washed away part of the uh, soil, some of some of the substrate that it's on. But this plant right here, I was looking at it. It's in full flower, and I was trying to figure out what the shit it is. We're looking at the uh, the flower here, and I you know I'm just sitting there. St I'm looking at the the cupped sepals, those four cupped sepals. So it's kind of a four maris flower, four cupped sepals, and then you look in there and you got, let's find a, a decent flower that's open. You got a four maris stigma. There we go, there's a four maris 
stigma. You can see it's got four lobes on its stigma. You got how many stamens? Eight, ten, four sepals, four petals. So the number four is bigger, and I'm sitting there trying to think what would have four. And uh, you know, finally, I just had I looked in that damn, damn uh, Baja plant field guy. I looked, but maybe zygophilate. It's got kind of a zygophilaceous habit. Alternate leaves. You can see the whole thing right here is just just built. Look at that. It's just covered in a velvet. That stem just covered in a velvet. Just built for the heat. And of course, the leaves as well. Just built for the heat. Got a glaucous color to it, lots of velvet. Anyway, Zygophilaceae, of course, creosote family. This is Vizcanoa. Vizcanoa geniculata. Geniculata, however you want to say that. The bees are loving it. It's just, look at it. It's got a shit ton of uh, flowers up there. New plant for me. I'm probably going to have to collect this and accession it at the uh, herbarium. But that's what you always look at. You know, it's, you use flowers to identify plants, not fucking leaves. Leaves don't mean shit. Sometimes there's synapomorphies shared traits for leaves depending on different genera and families but you always you get a flower or a fruit remember a flower just matures into a fruit boom then then, then you can do a solid id all right you're looking at numbers you're looking look at that stigma you can see that stigma poking out from that look at that those four stigma lobes poking out from that flower hasn't even opened yet i wonder if it's protogynous if it's Female first. Well, oh, no, because they were. We've seen them both. We've seen both uh, Androecium and Gynoecium, male and female parts at the same time going off. Look at it. Just draped over a desert wall. Oh, look at that juice. You can see that green ovary at the bottom right there. Look at that. Ten anthers and then a juicy, velvety ovary, which will mature into a fruit at the hissing capsule upon being pollinated, like you can see right there. See, there's, old, there's last year's fruits. So most of the quote-unquote brush that's lining this wash is a species of ambrosia, all right? Ambrosia, the ragweeds, is exceptionally species-rich here in Baja. Got quite a few species. Some of them look really weird. Look at that fucking steel. Seriously, they got Encelia farinosa right there. And then, of course, the plant that Alan's uh, taking money shots of right here. It's a species of Acalypha, Euphorbiaceae. But you've seen one Acalypha, then you know the Synapomorphies for the genus, and you can know other species if you're in a damn Caribbean, if you're in South America, wherever. You can see it's got those little pink rods. Euphorbia is the family there. Look, dentate margins on the leaf. I've seen some in mainland Mexico that get uh, upwards of five or six feet tall. I've seen them on a Texas sand sheet in South Texas that get no taller than eight inches and just kind of spread. But they've got separate male and female flowers. Those are the males right there, those little rads. And then the female flowers look like little pink... Uh, Pink hairs. I'm Alan, tell us what you're doing with a black velvet. You get the black, you get a nice background, right? Yeah, I get a jet black background, and you can really see the color and texture of these flowers. You know, I should mention too, we're not trying to be artsy and shit. We do that sometimes. You know, there's a time to be artsy, there's a time to be fabulous, but mostly we want to get photos so we can identify what the shit we're looking at and also use them as references later for books and presentations. And that's what Alan does, uh, you know, for a lot of his uh, fungus photos. Very important stuff. You want a good depth of field, adequate lighting, you know. You could worry about composition and that kind of stuff, you know. Maybe you get some of these, you, you put them in a frame above the toilet or something. But, you know, mostly, mostly we're doing it for, for reference, you know, for educational purposes, nice. So this is, okay, so up there, you could see we got Pachycereus pringlii and a Bujum iconic plants of the Baja Peninsula, which separated from mainland Mexico roughly five to six million years ago with the help of the San Andreas Fault. And we will be filming some of these species later on, but you know, this is going to be a long video because I learned a lot of botany down here, you know, fiddly fucking around over the last, I don't know, 13 years or so. They were, I was still drinking when I came down here. You know, I remember many times getting hammered and uh, waking up in the middle of the desert to go look at plants. This entire wash which again, we, we would be during heavy rains, 15 to 20 feet underwater right here, is dominated by uh, ambrosia. It looks like, is that a tamarisk over there? You might have an invasive tamarisk, but it's this ambrosia species and probably a baccarus too, which just forms these broom-like, uh, these populations, these broom-like plants, you know, everywhere. They're doing some destructive ag agriculture on the side, but it hasn't gotten too bad yet. It's so nice being in a spot where the development has not, you know, the tumor has not really ruined as much as possible yet, uh, like it has in America. I mean, America, the United States just had too much land. They took it all for granted and turned it into garbage. 
Probably the ugliest, the ugliest landscape in the first world. All right, anyway, let's keep going up this hill. This guy we've been seeing a lot. This is a nice one. Again, you could just see adaptation for the dry. It's an annual, okay, it's the annual habit, so it's not, doesn't get woody, just, just shoots up, lives for a little bit, flowers, bangs, produces seed, dies, seeds stay in the soil seed bank, uh, and wait out the long dormant season. Annual, having an annual habit is very beneficial in the desert, and the further west you go in North America, the more annual plants you will see, right, which have a high generational turnover rate, so they can shift you know, populations can shift. Morpho the morphology of populations can shift relatively quickly because, again, they only live for a few months. And so, you know, lots of genetic recombination events. Anyway, this is a member of the evening primrose family. Juicy, oh, look at that juicy stigma out there. Uh, you see the four, remember, four maris flowers, okay, which is a, the first hint. Got four sepals that are reflexed right there. Uh, and let's see, you got eight stamens. How many, eight, how many stamens you got? can't really tell four or eight anyway four maris flowers and just the general shape of the flower uh the pollen also tends to occur in what are called vicin threads which is uh specific to uh onogracy maybe there's a couple other families that do it but it's they're not they're not many so vicin thread pollen looks like pollen that's kind of you know strung up on on a chain kind of like kind of like anal beads or something you could see it's flushing and stress pigments in the red the leaves have been highly reduced they got a narrow uh very extremely narrow they got a tooth margin on them and uh you know it's glabrous as hell probably tastes like absolute hell if you're an herbivore and uh and then the fruit of course will be where's the fruit they got these inferior ovaries right there fruit might even just be that thing that looks like a stem i mean it's the little a four four uh capsule dehiscent fruit so this thing would just i mean it would just look like a quote-unquote non-notable weed uh when it's uh dry you know but anyway ona gracie very species rich family here in the southwestern deserts you know, we meant to go up there, but it's taken us a long time. We've made it about 60 feet in the last 40 minutes, but that's okay because we're doing nice stuff, okay? Jordan's given up. Uh, Alan's totally at home, but, you know, we're going up there. He's a mycologist. We're in a desert. you got to forgive him. Anyway, we're going to go up there, and we're going to look at some of the nice stuff up there. Look how green it is here, too. Right, desert, but it's hard. You were so close to the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it sounded... It sounded like someone was staging a space shuttle for launch last night because that's just the ocean, you know, three miles uh, to the west. Look, they got all the plastic agriculture over there. That's nice. All that stuff will end up in the ocean eventually. It's great. Anyway, we're going to we're gonna actually finally go up here. Here we go. Fucking ableists, you fucking ableist super spreader. Settler colonialism, fucking asshole. And it's, that's tamarisk right there. It's a kind of a bad invasive. And then that, that too is also invasive. Nicotiana glaca, tree tobacco, can get upwards of 15 feet tall. Uh, and you, you can't smoke it, but it's also got some very toxic alkaloids that will supposedly kill you. Right here we got a Moria rotundifolia, another little white flowered daisy family member. Very common, also an annual. You also got the uh, Coriocarpus as well, Parthenioides. This guy right there doesn't have as many rays, any as many white rays. And also has those little striations on the underside of the flower. If I could turn it around, there you go. See that? those little pink striations. More dissected leaves too. Native Nicotiana species. You can see the flowers are kind of withering because they're moth pollinated. They bloom at night. Look at all those glands. See that? Those uh, glandular trichomes. Oh my God, it's got a nice little bug stuck on there too. And then, of course, now that I touched it, I'll smell my fingers. They smell kind of, I kind of like it. It smells kind of good. Nice Trixis californica. Also glabrous leaves. Supposedly, ethnobotanically, this was, uh, people used to smoke this. I don't know if that's true or not. Asteraceae is the family. Same family as our Inciencio, Incilia farinosa. Now, this is red diamondback rattlesnake territory. One of my favorite species of pit viper, but, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll see any out right now. I don't know, maybe. I'd love to, but they, they're kind enough to give you a warning beforehand. Trixis californica and Celia farinosa. Got a lyceum back there, nightshade family, edible edible berries. Ooh. It's a Fagonia, another member of Zygophilaceae, the creosote family, but a different tribe. Note, it doesn't have a, a four-lobed stigma on it. You just got those five, it looks more like a creosote flower, five... Uh, 
distinct purple petals and uh, kind of a weird branching structure, zigzag branching structure, highly reduced leaves, almost somewhat uh, spike-like. So we got this invasive misem, misembryanthemum species with those, uh, those bladder cells on its leaves, all right? Invasive as hell here, but it's not its fault, you know? It's our fault. Karyophyllales, so those are betalane pigments. Throw that red color in there, because uh, betalane pigments is a synapomorphy for the order Karyophyllales, order of uh, cactus, spinach, and beets. Annual habit here. Very important where it's native. Oh, about 5,000 miles away. Here, at the, I've seen places where it just tends to form a carpet and smothers everything else. But, you know, again, it's not its fault. It is a pretty cool adaptation, those bladder cells. We got a species in the genus Solanum, nightshade. Uh, family, uh, potatoes, tomatoes, etc. They're all in the genus Solanum. Very huge genus. Could probably stand to be split up. There's the fruit. You can see just the almost looks like a little tomato ensconced in that calyx. And closing that calyx, the petals have fallen off. Uh, the flower is gone. There's the ovary. But uh, notable about this is that it exhibits a trait known as protandry, so to, which means it's protandrous. It's male first. It goes through the male phase first. Look at this flower. You can see, well, even the style's falling off, but uh, those five things, those are just the filaments. Those are not the uh, entire stamens. The anthers have fallen off. And then uh, look at this flower over here, same thing, but the style is still on there, so it can get pollinated. It can, re it can be, re it's receptive to pollen. You get that tomato-like fruit that I just showed you before, but this, the anthers have fallen off. So this is a female phase flower. After an hour and a half, we finally made it more than 60 yards from the vehicle. You can see what Alan's photographing here is a cactus. Now these flowers are just starting to open up with the heat of the day. They were closed last night. They probably bloom for a period of three or four days. And again, they do close at night because their pollinators are not out. At least, at least uh, <clears throat> species that are pollinated by bees, obviously. But some cacti are pollinated by hummingbirds, bats, etc. But anyway, you can see those flowers. Again, they were closed last night. You could see the recurved ends of those spines too, those fish hook spines. This used to be in the genus Mammillaria. Now it's in the genus Cochimea. Uh, and that happened to quite a few species uh, on the Baja California Peninsula. They all tend to have recurved spines. Some of the species that were originally in Cochimea show very obvious adaptation to hummingbird pollinated pollination they've got long red flowers remember insects don't see in red so they won't they won't be attracted to the flowers long red tube flowers and uh, you get those a little bit further south but now this is in the genus cochimea too uh, a friend of mine uh, peter breslin did that just put the paper out on it so you know i love splitting don't like lumping so much unless there's a good reason for it but uh, i do love splitting this is a rather large uh, individual of cochimea too and he's got that wonderful black velvet in the background as well See the dominant shrub up here is another species of ambrosia. This is another species of ambrosia just like was growing in the, the same genus that was growing in the wash behind me. We also got this mean cylindro puncher, this mean choya, which uh, certainly has barbed spines, so they will stick to you if you throw them at someone, or to someone else rather. Uh, but this is ambrosia kinopodifolia. Kinopodifolium, whatever the fuck, kinopod, leaves it look like a kinopod which uh, they certainly do. But you can see some of them are starting to flower. They've got rippled edges, dentate margins, and uh, let's look at the flower. There you go, there's these flowers are not mature yet, but you got a spike emerging. Wind-pollinated members of the sunflower family. So as you can see, these flowers are a little bit uh, more juicy, a little bit more intact. It's just the ragweed. You can see that flower spike is just the ragweed, which again uh, is uh, monoecious, all right? So these are all uh, technically one of these is not a flower it's an inflorescence there's a bunch of tiny flowers inside there they're not open yet you can see the adaptation for the desert covered in trichomes and wool kind of a white color but they're just gonna you know they've got the uh, instead of having a fused anther tube like most of us race does these just dump their anthers out so they, they can uh, freely release pollen onto the wind currents and then generally on most ambrosias the female uh parts that it uh the female inflorescences will be at the bottom, but I can't really see them here yet. Look at this guy right here. This is a Sahara mustard. One of the really bad invasive mustards. So we're going to go ahead and rip this out. Again, probably very important where it's native because they're so goddamn resilient here. But uh, here, they're kind of a pain in the ass. And you can see they've got, they're just covered in little, almost stinging hairs. Almost stinging trichomes. As well as, uh, you know, you can see that glistening exit that the... Uh, most likely tastes absolutely terrible. 
mustard family brassicaceae and then there's those tiny flowers so from a desert but just not this one very important in a desert somewhere but very bad in this one for these guys this is a this is a real i mean this is a this is i said wow you know i said this i said wow dudley apulvera lenta get quite a few species of dudley here this one's the size of uh, about a yoga ball you know i knew a guy who had a uh some sort of shepherd dog it, you know it was uh with a, with a longer hair than jack or louie and he would use a yoga ball to entertain the thing because that was the only they were so obsessed i mean it probably hit some it's like i am with plants they would just hang out with that yoga ball all day chasing it in the park anyway dudley uh, is a great example of uh of a farina you could see that that whiteness that wax that can be wiped off with uh say a greasy dago finger and uh you know that that's a protective wax that is a definition it's a good example of farina f-a-r-i-n-a -A. and then when it needs to get get pollinated you can see it sends up that flower spike right there i think this one's predominantly hummingbird pollinated it's got pink flowers but they're all gone they're all gone but there's tons of seed in there and that's that seed just tiny powder like seed these are very easy to grow put them on a mineral substrate keep it humid make sure they get lots of light uh, the older they get, they need it. They need it bright. They need bright light. They need aeration. They'd also do terrible in any place that gets summer rain. This is a this is a Dudley is a genus that's adapted to the Mediterranean climate, the precipitation regime of uh, winter rain, summer dry, which is what you get here. So you know you go further south, the Dudley will start to disappear because as you go further south down the the Baja Peninsula, you start getting summer rain, just like mainland Mexico. Look at it, Stenocereus. Stenocereus doesn't give a shit. I'm growing that in Texas, though. Stenocereus gomosus does great. From seed I bought off somebody that was selling the fruits on a on a side street here, you know, just south of Ensenada, probably, uh, I don't know, five years ago. Yeah, that massive Dudley right there, too. God, it's just a fucking great plant. This used to be all over. You could step right up. We're kind of in the cut now. You used to be able to step off the road and see these, but poachers nab most of them. Oh, look into my farina. A lot of cacti get farina as well. Succulent plants from very uh, dry places can get a lot of farina. Some alpine plants can do it as well. But it's just the wax. I don't see any hairs here, do you? Look at that. Look, that powder. it's powdery almost. I don't even want to touch it. I want to mess up this masterpiece. Masterpiece of nature. Right here, this is not the best specimen, but it is flowering. Euphorbia misera. A shrubby euphorb. Talk about a genus that probably needs to be split up. Look at a, look at that cyathium. Those cyathial bracts all glistening, producing just microliters of nectar. That red stuff right there. And then, of course, that dangling ovary. It's technically a, I mean, it's a dangling female flower. Because you know, cyathium is technically an inflorescence. It's a compound flower. So it's not, technically not just one flower. Don't ask me. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't write the fucking literature on us. I'm just saying. Anyway, <clears throat> it's a nice one. You got ovate leaves again, waxy, no hairs. Just growing here with the uh, Stenocereus gamosus, the galloping cactus, and the Ambrosia kinopodifolia. Look at this Dudley getting ready to go off. Ah, ah! Come back in a month. Those those inflorescences will be about well, as tall as this one, right here, about you know four feet off the ground, covered in tiny pink flowers. Look at the betalanes. Those beautiful pigments on that uh, gamosis. My friend gamosis. God, I love this. I fucking love this plant so much. Look at those spines. Ah, this thing is just, just a fucking, it's just a beast, man. It's just a, <laughs> it's just galloping cactus. Oh, it's so miserable about that euphorbia. I think it's pretty lovely. This shit, there's a mushroom growing on the ambrosia. Is it growing on it or growing with it? Alan, come here, look at this. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's growing on it. It's eating the stem there. What the that's shit is That's a gymnopilus. Oh. The bright orange spores, bright orange gills. What the fuck? Yeah, that's really cool. Look, it's a desert mushroom that's not secotioid, that doesn't have a cap that doesn't open. You can see the cap is cracking as it dries out. Yeah. This thing's going to taste really bitter and might have psilocybin. Look at that. Yeah, you said they make so many spores. Look, it's got spores on my thumb. Yeah, it's drying out. There's... Jesus Christ. And I was eating that ambrosia. Yeah, this would probably grow really well in Texas with the dry weather there. 
You can see there used to be a veil and the veil broke when the cap opened and it leave this residue here. So these are the veil remnants and then a whole bunch of spores stuck to the veil remnants. So that's why you got this orange ring here. What, what does the mycelium do when it's hot as fuck and doesn't rain for six months? It goes dormant. Okay, so what's going on with this gymnopilus we found? So we picked it about half hour ago, and now the stem bases are turning green. So that's the blue staining from the silosin polymerization. And in gymnopilus, it's got so much of this yellow color that the blue staining makes it look green. And so, and you tasted it, you said. You tasted I tasted it. it. It tasted just like cubes, but also like a bitter flavor. So it had this kind of cucumber odor. Oh. And it's a psilocybin, you think? That's, this is definitely the psilocin polymerizing. Psilocin. So everything that has psilocin also has psilocybin and a bunch of other alkaloids, too. Oh, my God. So this is a psychoactive species, probably. Yeah, probably the only psilocybin mushroom that grows out here in this desert, unless we can find that paniolus again. Of course, here we got jojoba, okay? You know, you, just, you make your cold press and oil out of that. You put it on your face so you don't get all, all leathery and shit in your old age, you know, which we all do, especially if you're, if you're living a good life. You're going to get leathery. Simonziaceae, uh, Simonzia chinensis. I think it's the only plant, the only species in the family. There's a selenum again. See that? There's a, there's a nice one with those juicy anthers. Desert selage. That's pretty cool. They could just dry out and go dormant. The lycophyte. Ancientlineage.com. You got a, what is it? Just selaginella bigelovii. Same genus as the quote unquote resurrection. Uh, plant the uh, well, there's like five different species with that name, but I'm thinking of uh, specifically Selaginella lepidophila. All this stuff's just conglomerate. Got a species of Marabolus as well as our old friend Ariagonum fasciculatum, the buckwheat. You can see, you know, the chaparral, California chaparral elements from the north blending with the desert. And right there, we got a wonderful cactus that I once tried to grow in Texas. I think, uh, who was it? The uh, uh, Tree of Life over there in uh, Orange County gave me a, a seedling and it just melted. Because this, this tends to like the coast. Burgero Cactus Emorii going off right there. Get, there's those fruits, a bunch of fruits right there. And I had a hell of, what's supposed to eat those? What's going to disperse those things? They probably just fall off, got very long lived seeds in them, and then uh, I would presume they just kind of disintegrate in the desert heat and. Either way, great fucking species here. The golden torch, and it hybridizes with some of the uh, surrounding other columnar cacti, creating a very cool interspecific hybrid. Look at that. You just got bah, lit up right there. Look at that giant Dudleya uh, hiding amongst the ambrosia. Oh, my God. Huge colony of Bergero cactus over there. I didn't even see that. That's a real nice one. You know, now I'm kind of worried. I get some of those... Some of those poachers, those uh, come from overseas. You get Korean, Chinese poachers, whatever. I'm glad they like the Dudleys, but I don't even know at what point does it turn into just primate hoarding, good old primate hoarding, and trying to make money versus actually appreciating a plant. Because they're so easy to grow from seed, there's no reason to poach. You know, you can get a Dudley of that big probably in five or ten years, grow a fucking greenhouse of them. Why you got to come here and poach it? <gasps> Look, there's Myrtillo cactus, Cochal. Myrtillo cactus aka the blueberry cactus because it pr produces those those lovely blueberry like edible fruits yeah that's see that's a, that's an odd strategy for a plant man you just you know there's the fruits it's got tons of good seeds inside there those little shiny black things but you know i said just say why you want to do that why do you want to do that why are you gonna why are you gonna put your nothing can disperse that for you so what are you waiting for You're just waiting for for, they're not going to go very far from the plant. You're just waiting for them to fall off and dehisce. Must be very long-lived seeds, as most desert plants tend to have. And look at that lovely color. I love this fucking plant. This is a great plant. This is a great plant adapted to a very specific uh, climate and habitat. All right, the fog. This is good. We're kind of a fog desert here. We're so close to those cold ocean currents, you get enough fog. Bergero cactus amorei, everybody breeze is so nice beautiful it's beautiful it's like wonderful temperature nice colony of bergero cactus covered in uh, what appears to be mara probably macrocarpa you can see there's the fruit of that mara right there cucumber family cucurbitaceae aka the man roots can form a huge underground tuber the size of a human corpse that's the name man roots see there's some uh there's some nice fruits over there there you go there's them fruits up close and it's still flowering too. So, you know, most of the cucurbitaceae, it'll have uh, many more male flowers than female flowers. So it doesn't have perfect flowers, doesn't have bisexual flowers, 
it's got it's monoecious, so it's got male and female flowers in the same plant, but it's, they're, they're all unisexual. And the way you can tell it's a female flower, because uh, oftentimes the the inner parts of the flower, the gynoecium, can look a lot like the uh, male parts. So you got to look. You just look for which flower has an ovary subtending it. It's in point right there. See that? You still got the flower on there. It's withering. That's a that's a nice female flower. Many more males than females. Kind of a sausage party, as far as uh, plants go. A lot, of, a lot of members of the cucumber family, cucurbitaceae, do that. See that ovary beneath the flower. Aveshaii, subspecies Goldmaniana. It's nice when they do this. They look like a caterpillar sometimes. They're super elongated, leaning over. You know, I didn't mean to, to film this long. I mean, this is really, this is really kind of excessive. That's a massive bastard over there. You can see this one's producing offsets. It's done flowering. Those offsets are those just individuals. Little Dudleya hiding beneath the Choya. Tillo cactus cochal, everybody. Look, it's super plump. It's obviously rained here a bunch. And there's the uh, fruit in question, a blueberry. If you're not ready yet, it'll turn, it'll turn a it'll darken and turn blue when it uh, when it is done. But it's in the name, Myrtillo cactus. What's this is this cylindro puncha molesta. I, you know, I don't know, I can't tell. It, it might be. There's so much cylindro punch of diversity over Look at that nice pack of serious pringly eye. Did a drawing of that, everybody thinks it's a saguaro. You got one of the uh, euphorbia, the spurges down there, it's getting hit by the, is that a bee? I can't see what that is. Is that a native bee or a honeybee? Look, he's, he's getting all of them. Little ground spurge. So there's, there's a mam right there that actually stayed in the genus Mammillaria. Mammillaria brandigi. I almost looks like our native Mammillaria hyderi. You get you get in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, Texas, as well as northern Mexico. See, it's flatter than it is tall, much flatter. It looks like a little hockey puck kind of sunk into the sand. Prominent tubercles doesn't have fish hook spines like this one, which is now in Cochimaya. And then we just got into the cactus belt. Of course, we're seeing plants that you start seeing further south where it's hotter and you get away from the California floristic province and the influence of those cold ocean currents and the, you know, the, the well, you get winter rain all the way down to like uh, BCS. But anyway, uh, point is, here's Lophocereus shadii, the Sunita cactus, which uh, also grows along a very tiny strip near the border in Southern Arizona. You can see that the pseudocephalium, all those spines that have kind of been turned into uh, trichomes, like a little jacket protecting from the sun and this thing is, is super frost sensitive too. This is not a, uh, this guy will die back, but it forms massive stems and can get upwards of about, I don't know, three times higher than that. I've seen them, shit, I've seen them 15, 20 feet tall, actually, in BCS. See, there's that agave in flower. I'm standing on a cliff about 30 feet above the ground of this arroyo. See, the anthers have withered, but the stigma on many of those flowers, and there's about, I don't know, probably 1,200 on this whole plant, are still going off. It's very popular today. It looks like it's mostly fucking European honeybees, though. That's kind of a bummer. But, of course, the whole inflorescence matures from the ground up, from the bottom up, not the ground, but you know what I mean. The, the flowers close to the ground are done. These are still going off, and the ones at the very tippy top have not opened yet. I just still can't get over the size of some of these, these Dudley... Uh, Every garden in Southern California should have one. A Dudley a Pulverolenta this size. Kill your lawn. I'm starting to think there's something else going on with that Solanum. It's not just Protandrus. It, uh, I think there's something else. Like, does that style even elongate or is it just sterile? Are flowers functionally pistillate or staminate? Or uh, some can be both, but most, you know, will only... I mean, this is... It's kind of weird. So, uh... And some solanums do that. It's not as simple as just being, you know, male first and then female first. But all this pollination biology shit's really interesting because then you start to figure out, I mean, there's just so many little hints and clues into evolution and the, the you know, maybe it corresponds to a certain pollinator, you know, extant or uh, or recently extinct. Who knows? Either way, there's uh, porocidal anthers like all solanums have, so they got to be buzz pollinated. You can see the little pores at the end of those juicy anthers right there. And then uh, there's that style in the center right there, but it doesn't look like it elongates. It looks like it might just be sterile. It could also be fertile, but uh, it's kind of hard to believe, so I don't know. Who knows what the shit's going on, you know? But I'll take a bunch of photos. And see, this plant has many, many flowers with anthers on them, so it doesn't look like they necessarily just fell off. But see, there's a style as well. So some, uh, 
maybe some plants are just female and then other plants can be bisexual. Who the fuck knows? And growing on this cliff, we got a different species of Dudleya. It's got speckling on those, uh, we got red speckling on those uh, lanceolate leaves too. Much different habit than the pulverolenta. Little myrtillo cactus seedling. See that growing? Using all this shrub cover as a, as a nurse plant. Hi, Jack. You're doing good. There he is, the old man. He's back on the road. He's back in a saddle. Going to be 15 in May. We're giving him, giving him all the uh, carne asada tacos he can handle. You know, just going to stuff. Look at this little egg mist by. What is that? The genus formerly known as lotus. At the plant... Formerly known as Hyptus amorei, now Condea amorei, desert lavender, fuzzy as hell, adapted to the driest desert, uh, the driest section of North America. Out here, the further west you go, the drier it gets. That's why this thing has calices, that is conglomerations of sepals, that are just covered in fuzz. There's those tiny flowers. So reduced flowers, lots of hair, uh, reduced leaf size. The leaves are covered in... Uh, Bunch of trichomes, those are all trademarks of plants that evolve in deserts, of course. As you've heard me say so many goddamn times. Look at the god, this thing smells incredible though. Mint family Lamiaceae, bumblebee pond, and you can see those uh, styles up top, and those, uh, there was a two or four, it looks like four stamens down below. But everything is just so woolly, all right? Not as woolly as uh, Funeral Sage, Salvia funeraria from Death Valley, but, but impressive nonetheless, it just smells so good too. Further down the road, you got a nice, uh, some nice bujum trees, Fulcaria columnaris, Ocotia relative, nice Lophosiria shadii. And we're at the base of that uh, monolith that I thought was Cretaceous sediments, but at looking closer, it appears to just be conglomerate. So, you know, God knows how long ago that was put there, probably, you know, maybe a million years, 500,000 years, but at some point that was uh, a habitat, much like, not a habitat, but a landscape much like we're at now basically an, an arroyo a desert was so that's just that's just flash flood it's basically just flash flood after flash flood after flash flood all piling up and uh, for some reason it's more resistant to erosion right here than over there but i thought that was the, there are cretaceous sediments nearby i seen them on the geologic map but that is all that's all goddamn conglomerate that's all just alluvial material down a wash look we got a nice menzilia velcro leaf family look at the trichomes on there whole family lois ac is known for those uh, trichomes for those barbed trichomes that's what makes them like a velcro leaf you could stick the leaves to your shirt some of them sting especially the ones in south america multiple stamens five petals and out uh, of fruit is a dry capsule uh as you could let's see if you could see yeah there you go see that'll dry out there's like this little capsule fruit with those you can see the residual uh sepal ends on it so you know, residual sepals, inferior over residual sepals and, uh, and trichomes. But either way, I'm looking at this, this what I've always called the monolith that I thought was, you know, Cretaceous sediments, but I've only ever seen it from way far away. Those are not Cretaceous sediments, that is conglomerate. And see how it's, it's in layers, there's striations, horizontal striations, but they're not even like they would be if that was, uh, was uh, you know, Cretaceous marine sedimentary, right? They're kind of uneven. I kind of like uh, someone got, you know, got a little loose with a paintbrush, just, you know, scribbled on the wall back and forth with lashes, you know. That's what it looks like. And you can see, of course, all those large boulders and sconce on the rock. So that's just a result of many uh, flash floods and uh, alluvial deposits washing out the surrounding mountains from deeper within the peninsula. Uh, God knows how long ago. I mean, the ground level had to have been up there when those were getting put put up. I guess it could have been earthquakes that slightly lifted it up, too. Who knows? But either way, everything's changed. I've seen it from a mile away. I always figure it's sedimentary rock. Now it's actually just conglomerate. Again, that brassica turn of 40 eye Sahara mustard. Look, look how massive that is, sucking up so much moisture that could be used by native plants. That's part of the reason it's such a bad invasive over there. The phaseolus over here, trifid leaves, the genus of beans. Society for the Appreciation of uh, Lesser Known Beans. You can see that twisted keel right there. Wing petals and then the big banner in the background. So you got some trichomes on the calyx. Wonder if, uh, I, yeah, wonder if it produces edible fruit like so many of the beans do, like tepary beans in uh, the Sonoran Desert, which is also the genus uh, Phaseolus. It's just the cage of the galloping cactus. It's just the whole damn thicket. Ostina cereus gamosa. So I wonder how many plants that is. There's probably only two or three individual plants. Moth pollinated. I guess they do the bee thing too. 
but they're big white flowers and they stay open at night. God, I love this biome. Oh, I love, I love the the fucking deserts down here. How amazing! Ocotillo in the background, and you got Boo Jums a little bit behind me. Same genus, just different variations on a theme. Both in the genus Fulcaria, a massive monolith of a all oh, that goddamn conglomerate. Just, just alluvial deposits. Wash after wash after wash. Flash flood after flash flood. Smells great down here. Anyway, that's all I got. Go fix it. Bye. Say bye, Alan.